Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. My name is Christina Hireas, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Hellenic American Cultural Foundation. Our foundation is a nonprofit that works to put on high quality events on Greek history, politics, and current affairs, fine arts, musical arts, um, and now science. So it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today. And um, it's with great pleasure that I introduce our featured speaker tonight, the MIT uh, professor and award-winning computer scientist, Professor Cosandinos Daskalakis, who will discuss the state of artificial intelligence. It's my particular pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight as we're longtime friends and classmates from the University of California, Berkeley, of course, different programs. Um, and uh, that's where Costas obtained his PhD. So while both of his parents come from Kriti, Kostandinos was born and raised in Athens. He studied at the Polytechnic University and then went on to study at Berkeley, as I mentioned. Um, he's a professor of co computer science at MIT, working on computational theory and the interface with game theory, economics, probability theory, machine learning, and statistics. His work has resolved long-standing questions open problems about computational complexity of the Nash equilibrium and multi-item auction problems that uh, had prior to his work challenged and perplexed mathematicians, economists, and computer science scientists alike for several decades. He now focuses on high dimensional statistics and machine learning and is frequently consulted by major companies like Google and Facebook. In 2018, he was honored with the prestigious uh, Nevanlin Prize, which is given to an international, by the International Mathematics Union, along with the Fields Medal, for transforming our understanding of computational complexity of fundamental problems in markets, auctions, equilibria, and other economic structures. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Daskalakis. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks a lot for coming to my lecture. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for hosting me tonight. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be maybe the first science uh, lecture of this series. Uh, so I wanted to talk about uh, what has happened in the past uh, several uh, years uh, on the uh, AI front. Uh, in particular, discuss the question of when uh, machines are going to become intelligent. Uh, so, um, I can't start talking about AI without talking about computers, and computer science in particular, uh, because uh, talking about uh, AI from a scientific point of view requires you to talk about uh, computing from a scientific point of view, and uh, the foundations for that uh, were uh, 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 were contributed by Alan Turing, which uh, 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 many of you I hope uh, uh, have heard about because uh, his work was uh, super important uh, for our world today. So you probably know him as uh, 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 Benedict Cumberbatch in the Imitation Game. So which I hope you also have seen. Uh, so, uh, what uh, Alan Turing did, so Alan was a mathematician uh, from uh, uh, England. He did his PhD in Princeton, uh, and uh, his thesis um, um, provided foundations, mathematical foundations, for studying computation as a mathematical object. Uh, and uh, he ushered us to uh, a different era in computing. Uh, prior to uh, Turing, computation was very specialized. So uh, uh, the mechanical loom and you know, like astrolabos were uh, specialized computational devices that could bring about specific uh, computations. Uh, with Alan Turing uh, and uh, uh, so a, a, a few uh, scientists before him, um, we arrived uh, in, into the era of uh, general purpose computation. So uh, w the foundations that Alan Turing set allowed us to think about a programmable computer, a, a computer that could, you know, 
could receive as input a new program and execute a new program, uh, a, a program written by a programmer to bring about a specific uh, a computation that may change depending on uh, what the user wants to do. Um, one of the first programmers who in fact lived, you know, way before Alan Turing was Ada Lovelace. Now, uh, that woman you see here in the middle of the, of, of the picture. Um, so Ada relates a little bit to Greece. Uh, so her father is Lord Byron, was Lord Byron. So uh, Lord Byron abandoned her in England and came to Greece to, uh, 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 you know, help Greeks in the, in the War of Independence. So, you know, Ada was there, traumatized probably, uh, and, you know, decided to start, you know, programming uh, abstract uh, computational models. So in any event, so um, uh, general purpose computing allowed us to do remarkable things. And, you know, some of them were good and some of them were bad, okay? So we went to the moon because we could make complex computation that allowed us to get there. We also could simulate uh, uh, physics, uh, uh, you know, allow us, to, you know, allow us to, you know, to to um, uh, design, you know, like uh, atomic bombs and, and, you know, like other types of bombs. Uh, so, you know, computing, you know, can be good, or can, be, can be, you know, every tool can be used in a good way and in a bad way, okay? And uh, the same is true for AI, which is the topic of today's uh, uh, lecture. Uh, in any event, so, you know, this all started, you know, in the uh, earlier, early 20th century, and you know, by, by, by the you know, middle of the century, we had a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, computational models, and you know, like uh, into the 80s, uh, the internet was created, and then you know, in the 90s, the internet became commercialized, and uh, uh, now we have a revolution of how computing is used uh, in all aspects of our everyday lives, okay? So, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's no doubt that uh, computing has transformed the way we um, communicate with each other, the way, um, um, uh, you know, we discuss, you know, uh, you know, societal problems and, you know, like uh, political problems, the way we do science, art, you know, health, and so on and so forth. So computing has transformed uh, our lives. And the new frontier is the frontier that will entail uh, intelligent uh, machines, uh, artificial uh, intelligent and intelligence. And uh, um, in fact, artificial intelligence goes back to the same person because Alan Turing, about 15 years after he wrote his um, thesis at Princeton, and after he broke the Enigma code during the Second World War, he wrote this paper that you see there in 1950. Uh, where you started thinking about uh, what would it mean to have an intelligent machine? Uh, if somebody constructs an intelligent machine, how can they convince you that their machine is intelligent? This is the topic of that interesting paper that he wrote. And the first chapter, the first section of the paper is the imitation game, which gave the, the name to the movie that you all uh, watched. Uh, all right, so, and you know, with this little intro, let's jump into, in, into it. So what is even AI, okay? So what is even artificial intelligence? So there are many definitions. Uh, so one definition is this one, by Teller. AI is the science of how to get machines to do the things they do in the movies. So what do machines do in the movies? They do all sorts of things. They clean your house. Uh, they, you know, they're your friend. You know, they're terminators or whatever. Or you fall in love with them, okay? So, uh, or, you know, like, uh, they do simulations in your brain and, you know, your real life is not your real life, right? So, um, so this is one definition. Uh, a def the definition from Wikipedia, an intelligent agent is a system that perceives its environment and takes actions that maximize uh, the chances of success in, you know, something that it desires to do. Another definition is this by a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Patrick Winston, who recently passed away. Uh, AI is the study of the computations that make it possible to perceive, reason, and act. All right? And what are these? These are playing games, uh, understanding natural language, 
uh, reasoning about a situation, predicting, making predictions, understanding causal relationships between underlying variables, uh, understanding, you know, uh, having senses, understanding sound, image, uh, voice, and, and so on and so forth. So this is what AI, you know, I'm not going to define it. There are many ways to think about it, but hopefully this paints a picture. Now the question is, and this is sort of like um, the part of my talk where I want to ground everybody to reality. Uh, so, so what you see here is a picture that I took somewhere in Crete a few years ago. And okay, so there's a parrot, uh, you know, sitting in front of, you know, uh, a cafeteria or whatever. You can sort of see the sea in the background. You can kind of, you know, expand in your head what may be happening, you know, over here. There's a lot of things that a picture contains for us humans. Uh, but for a computer, this is what a picture is. So for, so for a computer, a, a picture, as it is stored in its memory, is just an array of pixels with different colors. There's no semantics. There's no objects in that picture. Uh, there's no uh, obvious uh, context in which this picture was taken. So. Image recognition is how to make the computer, uh, uh, which in inherently only understands pixels and you know like colors and intensity of pixels at different locations in this array, uh, making it be able to segment that picture into uh, the object that it contains, the animals, the humans, whatever, the the, the, the contents of the image. Uh, and understanding the meaning of the arrangement of this um, uh, uh, object inside that image, which is something we can easily do in our brains, but there's no inherent reason the computer should be able to do those, because in the end of the day, the computer was born, you know, like in silica or whatever. It doesn't know anything about our world. Like, why the heck would it be able to, like, in some, you know, the computer was built in some lab of some, you know some company that constructs computers, why the heck would it be able to understand you know, the context of our world to be able to segment the image into its contents? There's absolutely no reason to expect that. So computers are not, you know, you know, cannot do magic. They just do what we tell them to do. And in this specific instance, it's very hard to tell a computer how to extract objects out of images, out of raw pixels. So, so similar in speech recognition, we have a waveform, okay? So at every, uh, at every millisecond of this signal, there is some, you know, like intensity of the sound and so on and so forth. And um, what we want to extract uh, from that signal is meaning. So we want to, you know, understand, you know, like uh, map that uh, signal to Characters, language, understand, the, you know, extract meaning out of it. Okay, so can you see what is the meaning? Is so what meaning? Are it, uh, <laughs> the, lights are too the lights are too bright. Yeah, so it says Andra miene pe musa politropon. What what is that? The Odyssey. Yeah. All right. Cool. <laughs> All right. So um, so how do you develop how do you develop algorithms that can do speech and image recognition. So the obvious approach to do that is to uh, study very well the human brain and copy it, understand what it does to process image and speech, and just replicate it in silico. So, so that would be great, except uh, neuroscience is way behind uh, being able to understand. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe it's 100 years, maybe, uh, you know, maybe you have, you're more optimistic, but it's very hard to understand what the brain actually does. So, uh, okay, so if that's not an option, another option is this, to ignore what the brain does and try to come up with our own ways to extract information out of the uh, raw pixels or raw speech signal that we have. So create our own alternatives of the human brain. So discover our own computational procedures for understanding these things. Uh, this is the classical approach uh, that AI field took. Uh, uh, but the result that it delivered uh, uh, you know, in the second half of the 20th century were, were mediocre. 
We could do some things, but nothing uh, uh, impressive uh, uh, enough. So the approach that actually worked is, is a little bit of a uh, kind of funky approach that is actually common in computing. This is uh, you know, one level of recursion type of approach, which, which basically is the following. Rather than uh, us humans trying to design algorithms that are able to extract meaning out of uh, images, let's say, uh, we design an algorithm whose goal is to design an algorithm that actually does that. Does that make sense? Rather, rather than us doing it, because we're not smart enough, we design an algorithm whose goal is to search in the space of possible algorithms to come up with an algorithm that does a good job. So now, okay, what does it mean though, right? So, so you, the way you do that is you maintain a rich enough space of possible algorithm designs and you progressively, you start with an algorithm that might be mediocre, and then you progressively improve your design until it does a good job in understanding some examples that you provided. So you, you collect a bunch of examples from the real world. Uh, these examples serve as a training set for your algorithm. Now you, start, you initialize your algorithm at a mediocre uh, design, and then you progressively change the design until your algorithm is better, becomes better at uh, uh, understanding the examples, the training examples that you gave it. Now, where do you find those examples? And why does this uh, uh, amazing progress uh, you know, with image recognition, as I'm gonna discuss soon, happen recently? The place where you find you know, these training examples to train your algorithms is the internet, okay? So uh, over the past couple decades, the humanity has left a big footprint on the internet. These are, you know, this is, you know, there's a lot of information out there, uh, a lot of images out there, uh, stored, uh, you know, in, in you know, various computers around the world that you can, you know, download and create, uh, you know, big enough training sets so that this approach can actually work. Uh, back in the 50s, we didn't have that uh, big data set. We could try creating it. We could, could in principle, start taking photos, labeling them, and uh, you know, creating a big enough uh, training set to then follow this approach. But uh, it, it wasn't really possible with the technology that we had to, to store even uh, uh, you know, big data sets like this. But, but now we, have, we can create you know, big data sets and, and follow this interesting uh, approach of rather than you know coming up with uh, you know interesting uh, algorithms ourselves, uh, ask an algorithm to do it for us. So now this approach is the approach that uh, 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 computer science has followed in the past 10-15 years, and uh, the progress has been dramatic, as I want to discuss next. So over the past uh, decade or so, AI has made some amazing uh, breakthroughs in um, uh, image and speech recognition. Uh, in um, uh, text generation that I'm going to dis dis describe uh, uh, later on, in, in playing games at a superhuman level, like uh, 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 beating you know, the best player in the difficult game of Go, and uh, folding proteins, so, so folding proteins at a level that was not possible before. So these and a lot more are uh, breakthroughs that the field of AI has accomplished in just the past decade, following the approach that I that I, that I described before. Uh, and let's dive into this and see uh, you know, what you know, this progress uh, involves, or what, what progress has been made. But, but you know, I want you to remember you know, where I have anchored you, right? So, um, so what the computer inherently understands is pixels, row pixels. Uh, and uh, with that grounding, let's see what the you know, algorithms can do. So, uh, image and speech recognition uh, ha have progressed a lot, so much so that we actually use them in our you know, machines. Right? So our, our phones are very good at uh, speech recognition and image recognition, and this is why this technology has been deployed. Uh, but, but, but let's dive into this and see you know, fun things that people, like computers can do with uh, uh, um, pictures that seemed unimaginable before. 
So my first example is this, uh, actually, uh, this paper, which goes back to uh, you know, a few years back now, seven years ago. ago. So, uh, so uh, those people from um, uh, Tübingen, Germany, uh, created an algorithm that takes as input uh, two pictures. So one is a picture, and one is a painting. And the goal of the algorithm is to extract content from the picture and extract style from the painting and render the content of the picture in the style of the painting. So if you input uh, the algorithm, this picture from Tübingen and this Van Gogh painting, what the algorithm does is this. Okay, so it renders the content from the photo in the style of the painting. Uh, and again, I want you to remember the, the anchoring, like what is content and what is uh, 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 technique. Uh, it's very hard to mathematically define what, what in the pixels, what in the raw pixels constitutes content and what constitutes technique is not clear at all. We cannot define a, a, a mathematical function that you know, extracts content from pixels and uh, technique from pixels and combines them, right? So that, 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 that is like, it's almost ridiculous that this actually can happen. And all, the other thing I want to point out that this is very different from like the filters that a lot of, you know, of the phones and applications on, on our phones uh, allow us to do like adding a little, you know, flavor to our photos. This is different. This is really extracting content and uh, technique. So, so here's another example. So suppose you input Picasso to, uh, as, the, as the painting. You input this Picasso uh, painting, you get this rendering of Tumbingen. Uh, this is Turner. You get this rendering of Tumbingen and so on and so forth. This is, this is pretty amazing that, that this can actually happen. This, and it indicates that we have a deeper understanding of, uh, that, that computers have a deeper understanding of uh, you know, content and you know, other aspects of uh, uh, images than they had uh, uh, in, in the past decades. Uh, another example of, uh, you know, that, that, you know, tries to illustrate how, so, like, the, 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 you know, the, the level of, of understanding that computers have about pictures is this example. So, uh, which, you know, uh, pertains to image generation. So the, 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 the people you see here are actually not real people. So the, 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 those, those, those faces there are actually imagined by an algorithm. Um, this algorithm uh, converts uh, garbage information, so random numbers. So this is, there are algorithms out there that uh, take as input uh, garbage, so like, there's just you know, like uh, one number with a lot of decimal points, some random number, and uh, turn the crank, and out comes a uh, photorealistic uh, image. Um, in this case, the um, algorithm is trained um, on, the, on, on a data set called Celebay data set. Celebay data set contains a lot of uh, headshots of celebrities. And the goal of the algorithm is to learn how to generate uh, photos of people that could be celebrities, but they're not real people. So the idea here is that, you know, like God, whatever he or she are, is, is sitting, uh, has a distribution, uh, a probability distribution over all possible faces that could be celebrities. And out of that uh, distribution of our possible celebrities, it revealed to us the celebrities that we know. So, you know, Jennifer Aniston, uh, Tom Hanks, and so on and so forth. So uh, those celebrities are examples uh, sampled by God and revealed to us. So what we want to do is we want to learn from those examples to generate our own faces that could be celebrities. And here are some of them. Okay, so you can... You can plug in, you know, you can, you can take this algorithm and plug random numbers into it and you get a lot of faces of celebrities, which are fake celebrities, but they could be celebrities, according to the algorithm. Um, I guess, so here's one paper that uh, uh, some students and collaborators uh, of mine uh, wrote. Uh, so uh, here, so, you know, you see those black images, um, uh, so, so these are, like if you look closer, they're not completely black, 1% of pixels are actually visible. If I were to zoom in, 1% of the pixels in those images are actually visible. So we created an algorithm that takes us input uh, almost black pictures with only 1% of pixels uh, 
uh, available and tries to reconstruct what's behind those uh, almost black pictures. So what our algorithm outputs for this black picture is this person, for this black picture, this other person, and for this uh, black picture, this third person. Okay, so it, it came up with, with, with that prediction of what's hiding behind these black curtains with 1% of pixels only visible. Uh, and let me show you what was actually behind those uh, 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 black photos. So those people here. Right, so what, what happened is the following. That's what happened in our experiments. We took that person, we hid a random, we, we basically hid 99% of the pixels of this image. And you know, like we, we, we got back this almost black image with 1% of pixels available. And we asked our algorithm, hey, you know, you can only see 1% of the pixels, find the remaining 99% of the pixels. And you know, it returned this back to us, which, okay, I mean, it's not exactly the same guy and the colors are a bit, you know, messed up, but you know, it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, similarly, like, so we took that, uh, this person, we hid 99% of the pixels, the result was this, then we reconstructed it over here. We got a lot of features. I mean, again, the, 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 in all pictures, our colors are messed up, so I guess our, our algorithm prefers, you know, uh, less, you know, vibrant colors, but uh, also over here, there's a hat and there, there's hair, but our algorithm, I don't know, it took everything for hair. But you know, it does a pretty good job. I mean, it takes you know, the main features of the, of, of the picture. So how the heck does it do that? How, how can our algorithm reconstruct um, what's hiding be behind this almost black image? Well, our algorithm uh, was trained on a lot of uh, human faces. So it learned a lot about how human faces ought to look like. And when we gave it an almost black image and said, okay, can you give us a face that agrees with the pixels that you can actually see, uh, it was able to reconstruct this. Why? So the, uh, the algorithm didn't start from scratch. It, it already developed in the training process an understanding of how humans should look like. So when we only gave it uh, little information, it could fill in the details. Uh, we humans are worse at doing this, like not as good as uh, this, but you know, like uh, you could imagine that, you know, like at, at the very least, if I took this image and I, only, and I hid you half of the face, you would be able to reconstruct it. Why? Because you know that faces should be symmetric. If you only see one eye, there should be another eye over there. The boundary should be the nose, uh, you know. So, you, so you, you have this understanding, right? Because you have lived in that world and most people are symmetric and so on and so forth. Uh, so you kind of do that least. If, 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 I, if I were to hi hide half of the image, uh, you would be able to almost reconstruct it. Uh, I mean, you know, okay, like if this person is wearing two different earrings in the two, on the two sides, you wouldn't be able to tell that from half the image, but uh, you could do a pretty good job. So our algorithm does a good job, but it sees much less than, uh, you know, just ha half the image. That's pretty cool. Uh, so so th this three examples were, these two examples were to say that um, computers understand natural images well enough that they can extract content from them, that they can generate, hallucinate, uh, you know, uh, natural looking images, they can fill in details that are missing from an image. Uh, that cannot happen if you don't understand uh, how the world ought to look like. So we understand it because we live in this world and we have, you know, we uh, know a lot about the world. It's pretty amazing that uh, uh, computers that inherently only understand pixel values are able to do that. So, um, you know, image recognition is a, you know, pretty advanced field in AI, and for this reason it's already deployed in our computers and, and cell phones and stuff. Uh, here's another field that is in the brink of a revolution, and that has to do with uh, text generation uh, and what are called language models. Language models are AI models that are able to predict the next word in a sequence of words. So you give, you know, you give the model you know, a sequence of words and they can propose possible continuations of that sequence of words. The baby version that you might be familiar with is you know, when your phone, like when you're texting with somebody, 
uh, you know, recommends possible replies to, you know, the, the, the party you're talking to. That is the baby version of that. But if you develop them in, in, you know, on steroids, uh, you get amazing results, okay? Much more impressive than the, 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 the recommendation that we see on our cell phone. So I want to talk a bit about this uh, model called GPT-3 that was developed by a company named OpenAI. And this model was trained on the corpus of all the internet, all of Wikipedia. So, so, so it, it was developed on a gigantic corpus of texts, okay? So these texts were given to this model as tr uh, training data. It trained on this uh, text to be able to do a good job at predicting, given a sequence of words, the next one. After you train it, you can use it in the following way that I'm gonna show you. So you can give it a prompt and ask it to continue the prompt. Here are some examples. So you go to this uh, model and you, say, and you give us prompt this, uh, correct this to standard English column she no went to the market. This is the prompt. Now the model has to think about what could follow that prompt. What, according to the model, should follow this prompt is she didn't go to the market. This is ridiculous, right? I mean, this, <laughs> this the, the, so, so, right? So again, the model was not trained on correcting wrong English to good English. It was only trained on predicting what should follow a sequence of words. So if you give it this sequence of words, which it doesn't understand what they are, like it just knows correct, these to standard English, these are just tokens in the, in the head of this model, these are just tokens, okay? And it has learned that, you know, like with high probability, after this sequence of tokens, the first thing should be she, the second token should be didn't, Third token should be go to the market. So being able to correct English is a byproduct of being able to guess what happens after. L l l let's, let's do this again in, in some other examples. Prompt, okay, so in gray it's always gonna be the prompt. Translate this into one, French, two, Spanish, and three, Japanese. What rooms do you have available? One, okay. This is what it thinks should follow from that. Uh, quelles sont les chambres disponibles? Two, quelles sont les habitaciones disponibles? And three, something that hopefully <laughs> is correct Japanese, uh, correct Japanese translation of you know this sentence. Right? This is pretty amazing because I never I, I never trained it on like. I never trained it on, you know, like explicitly on translating from one language to the other. I did not train it on this task, but I only trained it again to just predict the next word. And what it thinks is that after this sequence of words, uh, including one dot, what should follow is, uh, you know, this sequence of words, after which two dot this sequence of words, after which three dot this sequence of words. Uh, another example, okay, so this is, I guess, more geeky. Uh, you give it as prompt um, uh, a piece of code. Uh, in this case, in, you know, I mean, okay, I mean, uh, you say, you, you know, you, you just give it, I guess, you say like, you know, like, this is a comment in the code says that sort of like, it says that it's Python 3. So you can just give it this, you know, it, it doesn't know that it's a piece of code, okay? So you just give it this piece of code. For it, it's just a bunch of tokens, some weird things. And you say, okay, uh, explanation of what the code does, hashtag, and then it says, oh, you know, the code above is a function that makes uh, a data frame, blah, blah, blah. So it understands what the code does. Okay, so another one, and I think I'm done. Oh, it was kind of fun. Uh, convert movie titles into emoji. Back to the future. Bam, bam, bam. Batman, these two. Transformers, these two. Star Wars, column, it responds with this emoji and this emoji. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know. Like, how does it know what emoji should come after Star Wars? I've no idea. It, it, it somehow was trained on the whole of the internet and is able to predict that after this sequence of tokens should come this emoji and that emoji. 
All right, so that's uh, a text generation. And now if you go one step forward, you can give a prompt, uh, you, can, you can give a prompt and ask it not to continue uh, in words, but to actually paint you a picture. So this model called DALI, 3, DALI 2 uh, works as follows. Uh, so here's, here's some example uses of that thing. So you give us prompt, painting of a family of tiny hippos inside an old fashioned vintage suitcase. Response, this very nice picture of some hippos in a old fashioned vintage suitcase. It's pretty amazing. Um, uh, uh, another example, so prompt, a still of Kermit the Frog in a Wes Anderson film, 2010. And it outputs the same. I mean, how the heck does it know the style of Wes Anderson, right? Uh, or, I mean, you know, yeah, how can it extract Kermit the Frog and paint him there? Uh, and, and, you know, like just some other examples, right? So, a still of Kermit the Frog in Blade Runner, 2049. <laughs> a still of Kermit the Frog in Wally. 2008, okay, so it's really amazing. I mean, this, again, so, I mean, so this one is, was trained on a lot of images with captions, like a lot of them. And it learns what prompts, like what prompts and photos go well together. So when you give it a prompt, it says, okay, like, how, you know, what, among all possible images, what would go well with that prompt? And it comes up with these images. Oh, uh, final example. Prompt, an astronaut riding a horse in a photorealistic style. This is the output. In the style of Andy Warhol, this is the output. As a pencil drawing, this is the output. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Like that it knows, I mean, what you're asking. That, and, and it doesn't really know. I mean, it understands probabilities. It understands that, um, you know, this array of pixels goes well together with this prompt, while this array of pixels goes better with, you know, this array of words. This is, this is what it's trained to do. What goes well together? Amazing. All right, there's a lot more progress and promise of using AI in uh, various fields, including uh, health sciences and chemistry. But um, I want to kind of like switch gears and take a little more of a more critical view of what's going on. Because, you know, like this all seem impressive and we know we read about them in the news and even scientific uh, journals and stuff. But uh, the unredacted story is a bit more textured. Okay, these all are impressive. But uh, bad things happen as well. So let's look at them. So. Um, in this video, uh, you see the, uh, the Tesla car that is crashing, uh, crashing on a, on a, on a um, truck that is on the left-hand side of a, of a, of a motorway, um, of a highway. Why did it happen? I don't know, something in its recognition system didn't work. Maybe it wasn't expecting a truck uh, parked on the left-hand side of the highway. Maybe it wasn't in the training data. Right, so the typical are on the right side. Um, here are some uh, examples breaking uh, GPT-3. Let's not look at them, but let's look at some examples. So, so over here, let's look at this one. So with dark black, okay, so I hope you can see in bold, is the prompt, and unbolded is the uh, continuation from the model. So let's look at it. So here's the prompt. Physical reasoning. You're having a small dinner party. You want to serve dinner in the living room. The dining room table is wider than the doorway. So to get it into the living room, you will have to, and then this thing has to continue, and it continues as follows. You have to remove the door. You have a table saw, so you cut the door in half and remove the top half which is a fine, it's a fine continuation, but uh, not the one that you, you, know, you would suggest, right? Let's see, I think this one is funny. Biological reasoning. Uh, you poured yourself a glass of cranberry juice, but then you absentmindedly uh, poured about a teaspoon of grape juice into it. It looks okay, you try sniffing it. 
but you have a bad cold, so you can't smell anything. You are very thirsty, so <laughs> yeah, you drink it. You are now dead. <laughs> uh, you know, so you, so so you know, so so it, it, it's not really. I mean, it's um, it can continue sentences, but but uh, that doesn't mean it understands what it says or, or like you know how our world looks like. It doesn't reflect an understanding of the world, the fact that it can continue sentences. Uh, maybe another fun example is, let's see, this one. So, uh, so the prompt is gonna go up, up until, I think, um, here. So the prompt is the following. Which is heavy, question, which is heavier, a mouse or an elephant? Answer, an elephant is heavier than a mouse. Which is heavier, a mouse or a toaster? A toaster is heavier than a mouse. Uh, which is heavier, a toaster or a pencil? A pencil is heavier than a toaster. <laughs> this is the answer that it gives you. What's the problem? Well, it learned that the second thing is always the heavier one, right? So here the elephant is the heavier one. Here the toaster is the heavier one. So it's like, oh, you know, whenever I'm asked them such a question, the second one is heavier than the first one. It does not reflect understanding. It reflects some kind of you know, clever pattern matching using you know, all the internet and you know, everything you can extract from it. It sometimes works, it sometimes doesn't. Uh, overall, or these specific ones? These specific ones or these specific ones? Yeah. The whole presentation? I don't think so, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, I don't even know how to, um, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I cannot do that, but hopefully the fonts later on are, high, are bigger. Uh, oh, so here's a way, the model failure for the DALI thing, the one that gets a prompt and outputs an image. So, a quote, uh, so prompt. Oil painting of Elon Musk uh, tweeting about 420. Uh, so I already got some, you know, it definitely is a good one. But uh, okay, so it doesn't understand where the, uh, you know, um, you know the, the cigarette or the joints should go. So 420, you know, I heard, I didn't know, but 420 is the, I don't know, International Marijuana Day or something like that. So I mean, it did, uh, I mean, Dali, I guess, kind of knows it, uh, but you know, it has Elon Musk kind of tweeting, but it, it gets some of the details wrong. So there are some modes of failure. These are worse modes of failure because this mode of failure is uh, uh, humans being able to actually manipulate uh, uh, the algorithm. So at the top, uh, there's a video of um, showing a turtle that some uh, uh, students at MIT uh, 3D printed. Uh, and, you know, the students also painted the shell of the turtle in such a way that the, I guess you cannot read that, but the best, uh, the state of the art image recognition algorithm recognizes the turtle as a rifle. Uh, which is okay, I mean, you know, like you can recognize turtles as rifles, but what you don't want is in the airport to recognize rifles as, as turtles, right? So, um, so, so here at the bottom uh, is another experiment. So. Uh, they took, uh, so, so if you give the state-of-the-art algorithm in this experiment, you, you give the state-of-the-art algorithm this picture, it says the, it recognizes it as a revolver, but you just turn it a little bit, uh, you give this as input, it thinks it's a mousetrap. So, so he, this is recognized as a vulture, but you turn it a little bit, and this is a rankutan. So that's bizarre behavior, right? Not reliable behavior. Um, oh, and this is uh, super important. So, you you know, I, I, I told you before, like you know, like computers are very good at filling in the missing details, right? I, I even gave you an experiment where I gave the computer almost black images with only a few pixels uh, available, and the algorithm was able to reconstruct what's behind uh, the 99 pixels that weren't visible. So, in this experiment, you give the algorithm a pixelated image of somebody you I think recognize, no? Yeah, so what the algorithm reconstructs though, so the algorithm is asked to provide a crisp image 
whose pixelated form would be that one. So for the computer, the crisp image whose pixelated form is this one, is this white guy. Why did that happen? Because the algorithm, this algorithm, was trained on a lot of photos from the internet, which are predominantly photos of white people. So it appeared to the algorithm that the human race is mostly white people. So this was a more likely reconstruction of you know, the person who's behind this pixelated uh, uh, image. I mean, I guess you would think that Obama appears a lot on the internet, but I guess, you know, the, you know, uh, uh, I guess, you know, like, uh, white people dominate, I guess, uh, Obama's photos on the internet. And uh, that has, I mean, so th there's a slight missing here, but that, that can have a, a lot of, you know, as you can imagine, a lot of bad repercussions. So uh, uh, AI algorithms are used in the criminal system in, in, in the U.S. And... Uh, when you test those, so, and they're used to score uh, uh, people who have been arrested about whether you should detain them pre-trial or not, okay? So they give advice to the judges saying, you know, like, I think, you know, this person is very risky, so you should detain them before the trial, or this person isn't risky, isn't too risky, so, you know, you can, you can let them, you know, uh, free, free until the trial. So if you test those algorithms, if you stress test those algorithms, you'll see that they're very biased. So, uh, you know, you, 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 you know, uh, on the lines of race. So you, you can, you can, the, 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 you know, they're very strict with, you know, black uh, uh, people and, 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 and very lenient with white people, even, even though, you know, like for, for, for our judgment, uh, uh, you know, you may have a black person with very few prior offenses and a white person with like a lot of prior offenses and, you know, more severe. Uh, and, you know, it's going to score one, you know, it's going to say that the risk of the white person is much lower than that of the black person, okay? So, uh, you, you can imagine, this is a huge deal, if you, if you, if you, if you trust those algorithms. So, so what goes wrong? What, why, why, I mean, why do we have this, on the one hand, remarkable performance, amazing, impressive performance, I mean, those, those images that were painted, given the fronts, were amazing. So why do you have this amazing performance on the one hand, and this uh, important mo modes of failure and you know possibility for manipulation and, and bias on the other side? So so what goes wrong is I want to you know wind back to the beginning of my presentation uh, and and remember the winning approach that that gave us these amazing AI systems, right? We did not design those algorithms using our knowledge as humans about the world. We assigned that task to an algorithm. We told the algorithm, hey, your goal is to develop an algorithm that does well on a big database of examples that we collected from the internet. The problem with, as I alluded to before, examples from the internet is that they contain their own biases they may not necessarily be representative of the real world. So if you train, if you ask, you know, your little, you know, algorithm here to find a nice algorithm that does a good job on the examples that you collected from the internet, then it's possible that, you know, the algorithm that is uh, constructed is very biased. It incorporates those biases that exist in the information that is recorded. Um, and, uh, yeah, this is really what's, what's going on, right? So, so, so in, the, in the case of image recognition, what happened is that people, you know, in the late 2000s collected, created a huge data set of images that they sat down and labeled for their contents. And then they followed this approach, trying to develop good algorithms that uh, understand the contents of each and every one image of this data set, in the hopes that when these algorithms are presented with a new image, they would be able to also correctly predict the contents. And here's the performance uh, from 2010 until you know, 2017 of those algorithms. Around 2014, there were algorithms developed that could beat humans in how well they recognize the contents, they identify the contents of a 
random image from this humongous database. Right, so this guy here, who actually sat down and competed with the algorithm, is at, was at the time a PhD student at Stanford. His name is Andre Karpathy. He then went to, I don't know, work for Tesla, like he was the head of AI of Tesla, and you know, now he, I don't know, just recently resigned his role. But, okay, he sat down and, you know, set up a challenge between him and the best algorithm at the time and recorded whether he or the algorithm has lower error in understanding the contents of the images from this humongous uh, database. And, uh, you know, his error rate was about 5%. Uh, and, you know, around the time, 2014 to 2015, the algorithms got better error, smaller error. And, you know, like you see, the error there is tiny, uh, around 2017. These algorithms are really good in recognizing the contents of images from this humongous database. But here's the question, right? So this is the philosophical question. Is beating that particular human on a particular benchmark data set, is that a, a good proxy target for solving this image recognition challenge? It is a good start, that's right. But as I alluded to before, this data set was created using some methodology and its biases, it has its own biases. For example, if you look at all dogs in that data set, uh, you know, like the, the images of dogs in this data set are, you know, like in all images, the dog is facing you and behind, and it's in some grassy area, okay? You never see dog in the snow, in a living room, right? So, so this data set has a lot of biases because uh, basically the way this data set was created is people, like the pe researchers from Stanford downloaded a bunch of images from Flickr that they, you know, ask uh, people in Mechanical Turk to label them. But, you know, like people posting photos of their dogs on Flickr predominantly, you know, uh, uh, posted photos of their dogs facing the camera and in some, you know, outside, you know, like garden or whatever, or grassy area, okay? So this data set has biases, okay? And, and, if, and if my algorithm is good at recognizing dogs that face you, it's unclear if it recognizes dogs who, whose tail you can see or whatever, or they're in the snow or... So, um, so while we may think, okay, we, you know, okay, yes, so you, you were able to beat humans in this specific data set, you may think you're doing a great job, but if your data set is not representative, you know, you think you're doing well, but you're not. And like, I don't know, you, I don't know if you can see this graph, but, uh, you know, these are, people have tried to use these state-of-the-art algorithms when you change a little bit the data set and create data sets where the orientation of the objects is not uh, uh, straight or, you know, maybe they're not in the, like, there are other things happening behind them and so on and so forth. So the, the performance drops dramatically if you try them on other data sets. So how do you make reliable AI, okay, in, 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 you know, in, in, in the context of what I've uh, uh, talked about? So uh, there are a bunch of things that are important, okay? It's a, it's a very difficult problem. I'm not gonna tell you how to do it because I don't know how to do it. Uh, I know little things about this problem. But what is definitely important is the sample size. The bigger, you know, the bigger your training set is, the more examples you know have about the real world, uh, you know, the better you should be able to uh, learn the underlying phenomenon. What's also important, though, is how representative your sample is. Okay, so if you're training, you know, for a medical application and, you know, you're looking at a data set that has only people from New York, uh, okay, so I guess New York is pretty mixed, but let's say people from Boston, uh, it's, chances are your data set is going to be uh, uh, not representative of the whole human race, okay? So if you're, a, you know, a biotech developing a drug, right, uh, you shouldn't only... Um, you know, measure the effectiveness of your drug in this population or shouldn't design this drug on the basis of the genetic information you have about a particular set of people. It has to be representative of the whole human race for it to work for the whole human race. Uh, uh, you know, talking about uh, applications in genetics, what is super important is the dimensionality of your data. Uh, in genetics, you have this ridiculously high dimensional 
like the, the genome is you know millions of uh, 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 you know uh, has a you know the, the length is a million millions and uh, you know you're operating in such high dimension that it's a very difficult problem to crack. Uh, and other things are important, right? And, and in my examples, I alluded to them. Uh, the presence of adversaries. If you have adversaries, if, if somebody in the airport is actually, will actually try to manipulate your image recognition algorithm uh, to, you know, manage to, you know, checking, you know, the rifle, uh, uh, with the current technology, they can actually easily do it. So if there are adversaries out there, your algorithm should be cognizant about the existence of those adversaries and try to protect itself from the possible manipulation of those adversaries. Uh, another thing that's very important is like the technology used to take the sample. That's related to the representativeness of the sample. So like in a medical application, in a medical imaging application, uh, you know, if, if I only look at MRI scans from a particular, from a Siemens machine and train my algorithm only on those scans, it's not clear that it actually is going to work if you know, it's given uh, uh, scans from a Bosch machine, right? So you, know, you have to make sure that you have you know, the technology of the acquisition of the sample is uh, 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 you know, as important as the sample's representativeness. And in fact, it's kind of like another face of the same issue. And of course, something that is you know, very much uh, uh, badly used in, 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 you know, is, is statistics. So statistics is a hard field, <laughs> and uh, you, cannot be very, you cannot be cavalier about it. You have to use them in a correct uh, uh, scientific uh, manner. So uh, the, 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 pr the problem is very difficult, right? And I explained to you, like in the trajectory of this talk, you know, what information is for a computer. Information for a computer is just a sequence of bits. That's nothing else in there. From that sequence of bits, you want to extract content. To extract content, you, uh, um, uh, you know, need to train your algorithm. And um, uh, you have to use statistics correctly. You have to collect representative samples. Uh, you have to collect large samples. You have to be very careful about every step of the way. And that may, or may, and that may not even be enough. Like, I mean, in high dimensions, uh, they're just, you know, unless you make strong assumptions, there's no way to, like, high-dimensional problems are super challenging mathematically. So there's some thoughts about, these are some, uh, you, know, of, you know, what's happening in that, in that field, okay, and what's about to uh, happen uh, in our lives. And, you know, I mean, we all have to be, you know, careful and, you know, think carefully about, you know, the issues that may arise in uh, how this technology is used. Uh, I'm almost done, so I wanted to say a couple of things about a, uh, something that um, I have been up to that um, um, is related to this, and it's this Archimedes Research Center that is being uh, set up as we speak in Greece. So that center is a vision that I had together with Christos Pavarimitriou, who, you know, walked in midway through my lecture. Uh, Christos was my advisor at Berkeley, another Greek computer scientist from the big uh, scientific diaspora. And Timo Selis, who was an undergrad, uh, 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 so who, who I met when I was an undergrad student and uh, who's also another, uh, who's also now, uh, who was uh, until recently also another scientist from the Greek diaspora. So the three of us had this vision of bringing this little country, the Greece, in the map of uh, what is happening in AI research uh, in the world. We thought that this is important for Greece because, you know, we're in the brink of a uh, uh, new fourth industrial revolution, and we wanted Greece to be part of it. So after a lot of effort that lasted about five years, and um, uh, with a lot of stars aligning for us, uh, we managed to actually uh, create a new uh, research center. So let me tell you a few things about it. First, what is the problem that our research center is trying to solve? What we want to do is we want to create in Greece a, a world-class 
Research Center. Um, uh, focusing on AI and uh, the, you know, the supportive fields of algorithms and data science. Together with applications of these fields in the life sciences, the environment, smart cities, and digital governance, and also applications into the industry, especially those domains where Greece has a competitive advantage, like tourism, culture, agriculture, and shipping. Our goal is to train a, a set of world-class researchers and practitioners in those domains, support and engage with the Greek innovation and startup ecosystem, and, and, and build strong ties to the Greek diaspora. So, so we have a, a amazing scientists working outside of Greece, and, and, and what we want to do is build strong bridges uh, for those scientists to uh, uh, improve uh, research in Greece. So it was hard, it, you know, that was the vision. It took five years, I was, uh, as I was saying before, we were lucky actually that it even happened, but uh, we managed to get uh, a big grant from um, uh, the Greece 2.0 uh, fund that will help us operate for the first five years. Uh, after that, we need to fundraise a lot, so if you have any ideas, let us know. Um, we are in an independent research center uh, of a bigger research center that's called Athena. And our staff will comprise uh, 30 adjunct uh, faculty and researchers, uh, uh, about two thirds from Greece and one third from abroad. And about 100 resident students working co-advised by scientists in Greece and scientists from the diaspora. We are in the process of finalizing the selection of the researchers, and we're going to soon select our students. And you know, uh, by the beginning of next year, uh, you know, this is going to be uh, in almost uh, full speed. Uh, besides research, we're going to do summer programs, workshops, and other interactions with the Greek academia, industry, and startups. And in fact, uh, we just concluded uh, uh, our first summer program. Uh, We've had uh, you know, strong engagement with about a couple dozen students from Greece, a dozen student interns from abroad, not just Greeks, but uh, uh, you know, also non-Greeks, and uh, two dozen faculty visitors that came during the summer. It was, it was very exciting. I'm, I was, you know, I, I'm always happy going back to Greece, but this time, I, you know, going back for this summer program, I was you know, uh, 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 much more excited. Uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Daskalakis, for this really fascinating lecture on artificial intelligence. What is it, the basics for us common folks so we can learn about what AI is in our everyday lives, how is it trained, what are the biases, what does the future hold. It was really very informative, and for us, uh, being our first uh, lecture in the area of sciences, I think it was a really uh, informative lecture. And, and please join me also in congratulating Professor Daskalakis and, and Christos as well for all of their efforts with the Archimedes Center to be a part of the brain gain in Greece to bring intelligent, Greeks and non-Greeks to Greece to uh, make it a, a, an AI hub and to continue the research uh, going forward. So with that, uh, we do want to open up the floor for questions, uh, if, if anybody has any questions. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I was told I should repeat the question. So uh, but yeah, pl yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the question was, uh, what's the location of the research center and also what uh, levels uh, of students uh, are going to be uh, uh, the center engaging? So, um, so the center, so we have, so 
So we have a couple of locations at the moment. We have actually uh, two uh, locations. So one is within the um, uh, Athena Research Center, which is our parent organization. So there is a, uh, uh, you know, they have their own building, and uh, you know, we have space within Athena uh, uh, complex. Uh, the, uh, the the second location, uh, uh, you know, as I was saying, you know, one of our interests is to push the connection to the life sciences, the application of this technology to the life sciences. So we also have a space uh, within EVA, which is the um, uh, uh, the Biomedical Research Center of the Athens Academy, the Academy of Athens. So these are the two locations that we have. Now on the student front, uh, uh, we have, we engage with students of, of, you know, like all levels. So we are uh, interested in the talented, uh, uh, you know, juniors and seniors uh, who want to do research and engage with uh, world-class uh, scientists um, in preparation for their PhD applications or, you know, to just even test if they're interested in research. Uh, uh, we will have a big uh, contingent of students doing their PhDs at Archimedes, PhD research. And, uh, you know, the, the other usual, like summer interns, uh, postdocs, uh, but, but yeah, so the biggest contingent is going to be PhD student, but we really want to also help the um, um, uh, help the uh, uh, you know uh, undergrads who are soon uh, who, who, who want to who, who are close to graduation but are looking for outlets for doing research. So I was one of them. I didn't have outlets when I was in finishing uh, Polytechnia in you know. 2004, I didn't have those outlets. And you know, what, what Archimedes wants to do is to provide outlets for people like me, uh, you know, because you know, it's, it's, you, know, uh, you know, it's painful to be you know, you know, a 22 year old with a lot of energy and not having an outlet to actually be creative. So that's what we want to solve. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is how do you combine, uh, you know, I guess what I talked about, which is mostly um, solving prediction tasks with uh, human reasoning. Um, that's the million dollar question. I, I don't know. So um, I showed you how uh, training algorithms to solve prediction tasks involves actually being able to reason. But uh, as you saw uh, with you know, my bad examples, uh, this reasoning is not always grounded in reality. So it was an okay proposition to cut the door in half and try to, to use a saw to you know, cut the door and so on and so forth. So that was reasoning, but it was not grounded correctly. So uh, grounding is something that I think can only be solved if you look at the problem from a more uh, uh, from a broader perspective, so so currently, like so, so AI researchers for the most part look at small subsets of the intelligence puzzle. Uh, but uh, one would argue that if you don't have uh, a body and you're not part of the, you, you cannot just be shown images, uh, you know, uh, and, and having to examples of images and their labels. And try to understand, you know, like, and understand the world just from, uh, you know, looking at images about the world, right? So, for me to understand what a dog is, to come back to my previous example, it's important to have played with a dog, have been licked by a dog, okay? Um, um, so, uh, I think sort of like, you know, like this grounding. Uh, to, to do this grounding, we have to develop systems that have uh, a multitude of inputs and they have a you know, bodily presence. So I think that is the key to uh, uh, doing so. Um, uh, also, like, I mean, so, so, so AI has, you know, in the, in the past century, focused a lot on reasoning. So there was a lot of technology developed in the AI field for reasoning. But that has not tied with the amazing progress that has happened on the prediction front that I was mostly talking about. So one important frontier is combining prediction and being able to do deductive reasoning, for which there is technology, but it hasn't uh, blended enough with 
uh, being you know very good at making good predictions. So this um, this is another frontier that is important. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so let me try to summarize the question. So the question was, when we see a human make errors, we can try to learn from those errors. But, and the question is, uh, if we, about how the human brain works, but, uh, and the question is, um, when we see a computer misclassifying uh, an image, can we use that to our advantage and improve the algorithm? So uh, I guess my answer has two parts. One is we don't really understand the human brain. Uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, as far as uh, your second, your, your actual question, uh, yeah, when we see computers make mistakes, we can actually use that to improve the predictive power of the computer, except that uh, the, the problem is that we, cannot, we cannot consider all possible mistakes that it may do. So we can, uh, you know, every time, uh, every time you present a, uh, uh, an AI with a collection of instances where it's making a wrong prediction, it can um, change its internal logic to actually uh, do a good job for these examples that you provided. But it's possible that, you know, like uh, some other place of, uh, some other part of the, you know, state space, uh, other, there are other examples out there where it's actually still incorrect. And, uh, and you're, I mean, you're correct to think that these things are so complex that it's very hard, like, as the human brain is, right? They're so complex that it's very hard to uh, inspect them and understand, you know, how their logic works and, and, and try, uh, try to see uh, what could be their blind spots uh, 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 in terms of predictions. All right, so many questions. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's, I mean, I guess that's up to, uh, you know, I mean, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, oh, yeah, so uh, I guess the question is, like, what would happen in three generations um, uh, in the, you know, in how AI is integrated in our lives? So, I mean, so making that prediction would be me sitting, example, me sitting in 1950s or whatever, or, or you know, and making predictions, you know, like predicting the internet, predicting, you know, like everything that I talked about. So uh, I cannot really make a prediction. I guess what I can say is that in the next few years, despite the issues that I pointed out, we will be, we will be seeing this technology applied in uh, sort of like uh, well-defined uh, applications where, you know, we, 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 we understand the context well enough that we can control for the possible mistakes. We, we, we can control the acquisition technology. We can uh, come up with a representative data set. Maybe we have some domain knowledge that allows us to structure the architecture of the algorithm in a way that is robust and can actually be deployed in practice. So in the, in the, you know, in the, you know, in the next decade, I do see AI solving, improving uh, industry uh, by, 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 by is using, using its capacity to make uh, predictions. But this should be, you know, th 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 we should be careful in how we deploy that technology. And also regulators should be careful. I guess the White House uh, just released a report on, uh, uh, you know, the good use, like on, on the use of AI, uh, I think last week. So we have to be very careful in how, uh, you know, how this is used, okay? Uh, you know, uh, as users, as regulators, uh, you know, as attackers, uh, you know, um, yeah, or, or, or as defenders, I guess. Yeah. How are, thank you very much. Yes. This is a fascinating lecture. Um, how are researchers approaching um, ethics in the context of AI? Are you aware of researchers trying to develop algorithms to tackle that? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, uh, um, uh, right. So the question is, how do are there and how do researchers approach the issues of ethics uh, as they relate to this? So that's a very broad question, and and uh, the researchers are thinking about all sorts of aspects of the question. Uh, some aspects are very are, are more technical than others. So the example that I gave earlier about. Uh, uh, software that is used to make recommendations about who should be uh, de uh, detained pre-trial or not. Uh, you know, that has at least an explicit uh, challenge, which is don't be biased, okay, based on, you know, uh, you know the race of the, of the individual, right? So that has a, at least a somewhat clear definition that you can try to attack. Uh, or, you know, like topics around, you know, like the fair use of data, the privacy of the data, being able to, uh, uh, you know, having the ability to be forgotten, uh, you know, um, not having the algorithm, you know, use your data to then later on make predictions that are going to hurt you. So some of these problems are better defined, so you can try to look for some technical approaches to at least improve the state of the art state of affairs, but there are other issues that don't have very good answers, and it, it really is up to philosophers to, uh, and, you know, like, uh, with, you know, technical understanding to solve these types of questions, right? I mean, like, uh, you know, one example is, you know, the uh, example that, you know, a lot of us have thought about, I'm guessing, which is, you know, a self-driving car that cannot avoid a, an accident uh, would have to make some choices about whose life is more important, or like whose lives will be saved and whose, uh, who should be sacrificed. How the heck does the uh, self-driving car, uh, how is it going to think about the situation? What is, what is, what is ethical? Uh, is it ethical for me to hack a little bit the algorithm in my, in my car to make different predictions? And like, who's responsible? Uh, is it the manufacturer? Or is it the owner of the car who no, didn't make any, right? I mean, or, or if I hack it, am I responsible? And to what extent am I responsible? So th these are difficult questions that don't have clear answers, and, uh, uh, you know, are, yeah, I, I don't even know how to start thinking about them. Yeah, but that's an important, I mean, super important question. Uh, other questions about, like, you know, like, using AI in, you know, like, um, drones that are used in military applications and so on and so forth, so, uh, you know, uh, should we use AI? Should we use unmanned vehicles that go and, you know, be suicide, you know, like uh, drones in, in the battlefield? So, it's, it's, uh, you know, everybody has their own opinion, I guess, but uh, these are hard questions. Yeah. Yeah, so correct. Right, so you're, talk, you're talking about the, on the ethical side or on the broader training? Correct, yeah. So um, th there is subjectivity. So, okay, so the question is about subjectivity in how us humans make predictions, and you know, what does, you know, what does it mean for the technology we're trying to develop? Uh, and you know, I mean, so you're right, I mean, this is an important point. I mean, like, you know, we all have different perceptions of the world. <laughs> so so what, does it, what does it mean to, um, uh, what does it mean to be biased, right? I mean, that is it's kind of like the direction. So, but like, there are certain, you know, like, the, 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 there are certain phenomena that are purely statistical, right? I mean, uh, you know, you know, like how the body works and whether, uh, you know, like the prediction of the algorithm should work only for white people or it should work, you know, like for the whole human race, right? Like there are some objective things and there definitely there's no debate. There's no debate that, you know, like the technology should be inclusive. Uh, 
Uh, now, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, who should be detained and so on and so forth, it's a broader question, right? I mean, like, just to complete my example from earlier, in fact, th there's another bias, right? I mean, like, it's not just how you look at the, how each of us perceives the risk of a black person or a white person, but there's other issues, right, which are, um, it's not just that the data, which, by the way, where, you know, these algorithms are trained on, uh, data from prior offenders who were released, whether they committed a crime or not. So um, that data, of course, have an important truncation bias to begin with, because you never see the counterfactual of those you actually did not release, right? So when you have some data set, right? What is your data set to train this algorithm? So uh, you had, you know, some prior offenders, a judge decided to, you know, keep some, some in jail, release some of them before their trial, and some of those that were released committed crimes. So this is your data set. Now, this data set has a huge truncation bias, which is that you didn't release all of them to, to observe the counterfactual. So problem number one. Problem number two, uh, when a new case arrives, they come with some prior offenses and the crime that they actually uh, uh, you know, just uh, 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 did. So, uh, another problem that arises is that if you're a black person, chances are you have been arrested more than a white person who has done the same stuff. That's another hu huge issue that is already like, like, what is even reality, right? I mean, like, you know, like, for the algorithm to make a prediction, it's, you know, it starts with some preconditions. Even the preconditions are not okay. Uh, so, so there are a lot of issues there, uh, and, you know, and you know, some of them are you know, like just ob objectively, uh, uh, there are objective issues with the data that you have available or the preconditions that you feed your algorithm with. And yes, there is an aspect of individual preferences, and this could be tunable parameters when you train your algorithm, right? Okay, like if I have a self-driving car and I prefer to be an aggressive, you know, Massachusetts driver, you know, I can tune something in my algorithm and it can become aggressive. And if you prefer to be a nice person, you know, you can do that as well. So we could, like, in, 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 you know, individuality, of course, you know, we can, we, can, we, can, we can have, but, you know, what's important is that there are some objective, uh, uh, you know, uh, principles. There are some principles that have to do with, you know, uh, objectively treating, you know, things that should be similar, that at least we should guarantee. Yeah, so it's a bit of a broad topic, but yeah, some thoughts. Uh, yeah. Oh. Um, the, yeah, that's a that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you show me, yeah, if you show me how you developed your alg your algorithm. Uh, you know, I, I will. I will be more comfortable making that that call. Uh, uh, I think we will see some form of self-drivingness, but like I think, like for like full-blown self-drivingness, I think I, I would bet decades. Yeah. Like you know, trucks on highways might be uh, sooner. Uh, but like people in New York City, like in New York City or like India or Greece uh, or Athens, uh, probably uh, in, in, yeah, in decades. <laughs> yeah. And you know, like I mean, there is another. Uh, uh, There's so many variables involved. Mm -hmm. The human mind can make integrate better than the other. Mm -hmm. Maybe the I mean, look, the, the techno optimist, the techno optimist would say that uh, human drivers are not that good, <laughs> right? But yeah, the, so you know, so so there is that 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 aspect to it as well. But you know, like you know, would you like your self-driving car drive like a Greek driver? It's unclear. I mean. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, please. Could you describe um, in a bit more detail how you train the algorithm? I mean, is the computer running through the internet just, um, I guess, scanning all these pictures of pixels, or how does that work? 
Yeah. So let's. Yeah. So the question is uh, more details about how algorithms are trained to, let's say, recognize the contents of images. So I, I, I sort of alluded to the process before. So first, there is a data set curator that is uh, going to create a training set for your algorithm. How do they typically, like how, how these data sets were created? One approach is to look at Flickr. So Flickr is a database where people used to store in the 2000s, you know, they used to upload and store their, their, their photos. And you know, like, uh, uh, so you know, you could go there and download a bunch of photos. And then take those photos and send them to what is called Mechanical Turk. Mechanical Turk is an Amazon uh, framework that allows you to task uh, actual humans to do things. So in this case, what they did is they downloaded you know, millions of images from Flickr and shipped them to Mechanical Turk and asked humans to label, to write down what are the most important contents of those images. So if they would see a dog playing in the field, they would say dog. Maybe they'll say grass as well, whatever. They would give a bunch of labels for each of the images. So after this curation process, you created a, and there, are, there were some checks and balances, like you wouldn't give the same, you would give the same image to a bunch of humans to label, and only keep the labels where all these humans agreed. So there were some checks and balances to curate, for, for a good curated data set. So after you did all that, you have a data set with millions of images and the contents according to humans of all those images. Now it's the point where you have to train an algorithm that does a good job when given an image outputting labels that agree with what the human said about the same image. And that process is more complex <laughs> to describe, but uh, roughly speaking, you, rather than committing on a particular algorithm design, uh, you, you commit to a family of algorithms that is very big, and then you have uh, uh, an optimizer that says, tries to pick from a big family of algorithms. These are algorithms are called neural nets. So from a big family of neural nets, you want to pick the one that does the best job agreeing with the labels that the humans provided. After you find that neural net, you deploy that neural net and see how well it does. If it doesn't work that well, you try to correct it to do better and better and better until you settle at a place where you know, the, the, you know, the neural net you came up with does a really good job in agreeing with humans. Now, the danger that I described before is that this only says it does well in this particular curated data set and does not necessarily uh, perform well in a data set that was collected in a different kind of way. So this is uh, where the issues begin. I hope I give a little bit more detail. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Yeah, so, okay, so uh, that was a long question, but like, let me summarize with this and tell me if I missed any important features. So, uh, you, I guess your starting point was uh, your work as an oncologist, but uh, effectively your question is about what is, you know, where is human creativity and is this technology uh, taking away from human creativity? And I think, it, in my view, it only enables or redefines human creativity. So, in fact, uh, you asked me earlier about you know, immediate applications of this uh, technology. Like this, this DALI, all artists are on top of it. All designers are on top of it because 
uh, it helps speed up the creativity process. But then ultimately, there is a place where you know, the human has to select from some proposed images or modify them. So it is a tool that gives the human good ideas. But it's not that necessarily, I mean, for me, it depends on the consumer, right? I mean, uh, you know, if you want to, you know, create music for like, you know, a boring cocktail party, I'm pretty sure machines can do it, okay? Will they do, you know, will they compose the next Beethoven? No, okay? So they can, they're good at pretend art, yeah? So boring art. But they can be a powerful tool that can enable uh, human creativity. And indeed, these tools are heavily used by artists and designers. Uh, in fact, you know, like one of the, one of the projects, uh, like, you know, some of the students, I, I should have brought it, one of the students at Archimedes, uh, you know, asked this thing to design a logo for the Archimedes Research Center in AI. And, you know, <laughs> what it output is like, you know, like, Archimedes sitting somewhere with his laptop, with a laptop on his, in his lap, and he's like... <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so you know, it's, it's fun and, and stuff, right, you know. But you know, in the end of the day, uh, it, it redefines what art is. Similarly, computers have been beating humans in chess for, decade, for a couple decades. Uh, for about a decade, they have been beating humans in Go uh, and poker. What does that do to chess and Go? It redefines the game. So now, hu like, human players are much stronger than humans players from two decades ago because Algorithms help them, uh, you know, redefine, search better the space of interesting things you can do in these games. So this is how it works, right? I mean, you know, uh, these are tools. And, you know, what they do is they, you know, they, they, they basically define a baseline on which us humans, hopefully with better brains, uh, build. have a cocktail reception upstairs where you'll have an opportunity to ask Professor Daskalakis all the questions you'd like. Um, and also, if you didn't get a chance to pick up the brochure for this lecture, please do so on the way out. You could read more about Professor Daskalakis and the Archimedes Center and their work, and also about the Hellenic American Cultural Foundation. You can sign up to receive more invitations to events like these. So hope to see you at the reception and please join me in thanking Professor Daskalakis again. Thank you.